Yeah, indeed. I think soon we we'll just have AI note takers. Um, yes, so maybe let's get started. Um, so I can start quickly introducing myself. I'm Sara Petti. I'm the Frictionless Data Community Manager um, since more or less three years now. I work at Open Knowledge Foundation and I'm based in Bologna, Italy. Um, Peter, why don't you go next since you're just after me? Hi, Peter Desmet. I work at Inbo in Belgium. I'm uh... Maintaining the frictionless R package, and I'm using frictionless also to define CamTrapDP, which is a specification for camera trap data built upon frictions. And I'm moving to Paul. Hey, uh, I'm Paul. I'm on the uh, frictionless data working group. Um, also one of the authors of the specs, but I haven't been around for a couple of years. Um, I've done lots of data wrangling work in the last couple of years, but um, not using frictionless data. <laughs> uh, and I'm based in Tel Aviv. Would you like to pick someone to go after you, Paul? Uh, Keith. Uh, hey, first off, Augusto, the beard is getting out of control. And next time we see you, it's going to be like down your waist. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I'm Keith, I'm a postdoc at NIH, and I mostly just use frictionless for personal projects and anything that I want to share at the moment, but have a lot of ideas on how it can be used kind of for open source infrastructure and open data infrastructure. And with that, I'll pass it to Augusto. Hi, Keith. <laughs> I'm Augusto Herman, I'm based in Brazil. Uh, with an ever longer beard. Uh, I have been um, in the open data space for a long time. I have uh, worked in the Brazilian open data policy and data portal, but nowadays I uh, work basically with uh, data engineering um, for uh, using, uh, bringing data to our data lake and things like that. But we also have open data projects and we have been using uh, frictionless data, uh, especially uh, table schemas and data packages as a way to uh, improve data documentation and validation for open data users here in Brazil, the federal government. Uh, with that, I will pass on to Patricio Del Boca. Hi, thank you, Augusto. I'm um, Patricio Del Boca, currently working at the Open Knowledge Foundation based <clears throat> in Argentina. And uh, yeah, we are going to be working on the Open Data Editor. Um, so I'm jumping into these meetings to understand a little bit more frictionless. Um, so yes, happy to be here. And I'll pass it to Aaron. Uh, thanks, uh, Aaron Couch, based out of Philadelphia in the US. Uh, Currently, I'm the lead engineer on a um, modernization project for the federal U.S. government to um, upgrade uh, grants.gov, which is a where all federal grants are um, in the U.S. are shared. Um, I, I've been interested in this space for quite a while, um, and particularly we're right now we're um, going to be creating or trying to create a um, a. a financial opportunity specification. Um, and so kind of interested particularly in the um, community um, aspect of this this effort uh, today. And yeah, thanks so much. It's, a, it's just really interesting um, overall. Uh, pass to um, uh, Kyle. Hi, um, I'm Kyle Hussman. I'm um... Uh, based in uh, Portland, Oregon, but um, I'm, I'm I work in at, at Penn State in Pennsylvania. Um, that's interesting, Aaron. You mentioned federal grants. I'm 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 working under two federally funded uh, grants from the Institute of Education Sciences, collecting data, um, and I was brought on the team to to try and figure out a bunch of their open data. Um, management stuff and that's how I ended up stumbling on on frictionless um and so I've been um working uh with them um and trying out frictionless and putting the um education data uh, try, trying to release the education data in that format um I've been uh 
uh, also really uh, working hard. I'm really interested in um, being able to to create automatic documentation and code books from uh, data sets and data packages. So I've been working on um, software in that regard um, as well. Um, so um, yeah, that's it. I'll pass it to Andres. Thank you, Kyle. I am Andres. I am a part of the OKFN uh, technical team. I am based in Argentina. I I am not part of the frictionless uh, tech team, but I, I would love to, to learn how the people use this technology. And that's me. What about you, Anya? Hi, I'm Anya. I'm originally from Poland, but I work in Verona in uh, uh, Malati Initiative, but I'm a bioinformatician. So yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, that's nice to see somebody from Italy. And yeah, I'm mostly working in the clinical infectious diseases projects in European Union. So European Union funded projects, and we have a lot of problems with GDPR, with harmonization of clinical data, but that goes slowly also towards bioinformatics, towards, uh, you know, variant sequencing, human genome, all of the omics stuff, all of the buzzwords European Union wants you to put in your grants and then says, oh, open your data, and then you say, but, but, but how? So yeah, uh, um, and Keith invited me, thanks a lot, Keith. Um, yeah, I don't know who else, Luis, I guess, hi. Hello, uh, my name is Luis Guilherme. I was invited by Augusto to come here. I work, I work with him uh, for the Brazilian government. And there's more or less one year that I'm working with him, uh, preparing the lakes, uh, giving support to the, the government. And I'm very happy to be working with him. And I think to, to be here with you learning also. Um, I'm not sure if there's anyone who doesn't talk it yet. I think Phil still needs to introduce himself, and then of course we have Evgen. Okay, I'm Phil Schum. Uh, I'm a statistician at the University of Chicago and the Center for Translational Data Science. Um, the Center for Translational Data Science builds and maintains the Gen 3 framework uh, for building data commons and data meshes. Um, and has built and maintains a number of, of data commons and data platforms for uh, NIH. Um, and I'll just I'll use this opportunity to announce that um, we just yesterday uh, uh, publicly um, introduced the Gen 3 roadmap for the next year and integration of frictionless into that is one of the five key parts of the roadmap. So uh, if anyone is aware of, of, uh, of of Gen 3 or of any platforms that use it, uh, please let me know and I, I'd love to follow up. That's great, Phil. Wonderful news. Um, uh, Aditya, has Aditya gone yet? I think that Aditya is a note taker, so I don't think that she can actually. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. But our Evgeny uh, needs to go. <laughs> Yeah, I'm Evgeny. Um, I've been working on a fiction data for <laughs> like five years, and yeah, currently I am a, a member of the working group working on the data package version two. And so I guess uh, we all uh, introduced also, uh, <coughs> sorry, ourselves. So uh, first of all, I wanted to say that. This week, I, I've been working again on the proposal for the specifications on, on the discussions. And uh, yeah, I really wanted to say that it's like really amazing how. So I got so tired. <laughs> it's really amazing to see uh, how people do this voluntarily, basically, pro bono helping to bring that package to version two, which is like really impressive because uh, our work is funded by NLNet, but uh, we got like a lot of help from people just. And it's amazing. So just kudos. So and uh, the second thing, um, I I was thinking that maybe because we have kind of like a uh, extensive ag agenda for today's call, uh, we're going we will go through the like more general topics and maybe for in February and March 
we will discuss maybe some uh, the other package issues we need to discuss, like I mean technical stuff. Uh, and currently, I think we, I think I need, I need to work on some proposals, maybe that will be kind of like discussion topic. Uh, for example, like regarding profiles. And currently, we only have I think a few of them to qualify uh, regarding any type uh, or what we have else um, physical logical representation. But we we're doing this on GitHub. I think currently we can like doing great just in textual format and maybe just easier. But if you need to discuss something regarding like exact changes, I think uh, we can do it in uh, on, on the February or March calls. And I'll just pass to Sarah for the like the long list of topics. Yes. Uh, so uh, I thought about going through in no particular order, but maybe starting with more sort of like admin and governance uh, kind of decisions that we need to uh, that we need to make. One thing is we have this uh, issue list uh, that is currently being voted. And the thing that we're thinking with again is that maybe I'll put the link in the chat. Uh, we can use this kind of like voting system with a thumb up to sort of like prioritize stuff and has a sort of like mechanism for prioritization of um, features that need our attention um, for this specific review of the specs, but maybe as a mechanism in the future as well that we can use to um, understand what is needed and what is less needed in the community, in the sense that our idea is if there's a feature that might seem super important but gets no votes, probably there is no interest in building it. Uh, but so I wanted to know, first of all, what you thought about that. Yeah, Peter. Yeah, I think the voting is good, but it's a bit hard for me to understand the different issue lists that you have. One is all the issues that are in the milestone. I'm going to put the link here. I really like that because it also has a tracker to see how much work we've already done like and how much is still coming. Um, then there is the list where you can vote, which is a generated list of what gets to the top, but it's unclear if that is part of the milestone or not. And then there's also updates in the live tracker, I think the issue is called. And <clears throat> it, it's a bit hard to uh, keep track of uh, what I need to uh, follow. So the result is that I'm just watching the repository and get notifications for everything. And it's just a question of managing my inbox with all the notifications that are happening there. Um, and lastly, it's also a little bit unclear how you become part of the working group. I assume I am, but I don't know if that is the case. So I, I think voting good, but it's a bit hard as somebody who's contributing where the quote unquote official list is and what we should watch. So I'll start answering about working group. Uh, so we have that set up on GitHub. So at the moment, the team composition is here. Let me put a link in the chat. And I mean, at least for the moment, the idea is also that we're quite welcoming if people are part of the community and want to be part of the working group, of course, we're going to say yes. Um, that's the policy right now, also because it's not hugely popular and we didn't have like 2000 people wanting to join the working group. So that works somehow. Um, in the moment when we start to become super popular, then we might need to think about another mechanism. But I think that for the moment, that's all right. Uh, and in terms of the various lists, maybe I'll let Evgeny answer that. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, so um, the version two milestone is basically uh, the only like working list for for the version two update or whatever we call it uh, later, like version two or version one uh, dot one based on the change work. And uh, so I. Basically, as I'm working on the proposals, I have this uh, kind of like open for like the whole working time, this version two, I'm just going to the issues. And uh, I, what I try to do is to weekly update when, when I'm on the project, uh, weekly update live tracker, just to uh, ping all the people in the working group, because not everyone on the like each uh, mentioned uh, in the each issue. Or the version two. So yeah, so the milestone is a kind of like progress tracker for us, and uh, 
uh, life tracker is like notification mechanism regarding the voting. Um, so it's 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 pretty new. I just used the concept from Friction Spy repository, and uh, uh, what, uh, so it's not related to version two. But what I was thinking that uh, if some issues needs to be added to version two milestone, it's now a good time, you know, to to go through the issues and add uh, and vote for it, for example, or at least comment. And uh, but for the future, uh, we can use this uh, voting list. Uh, as a kind of like uh, as a signal for uh, something that we need to you know to work on or at least uh, to start discussing, but uh, I think mostly it's uh, for for the future because for version two we already have kind of like a, a big backlog. Sarah. Yes, thanks again, Peter. You wanted to add something. So. That's great. What is the decision process to make something part of the V2 milestone then? Is that just, yeah, there seems enough interest, let's add it? Um, like it's uh, pretty open. So whatever, um, whatever issue got into discussion and asked to be added to version two, it can be added, but uh, this voting, I mean, this voting is only if there is like uh, people not on the working group, and um, I don't know. But let, let's say for now, I think we can simplify things. That let's say that for now, for version two, we just um, include and discuss everything that is requested. But when version two is released, we just we don't have like a lot of resources, you know, uh, all of us. Uh, so we, we we wait till some issue gets like voted. And then we will like processes. If it makes sense. Yes. Um, I wanted to add actually to the chat. We have um well, we prob you probably all seen it, but we do have a list of issues that we collected through the years um, for the version two. And so for the moment, that's kind of like the general roadmap. Of course, as Evgeny said, we can be flexible about including uh, other stuff as well, but let's say that the main backlog would be that one, I guess. Am I right, Evgeny? Yeah, yeah. also uh, because uh, kind of like it's a collaborative work, like basically everyone is uh, free to create a pull request for any issue. We just uh, ask working room uh, for watching. So basically it's pretty open. I will capture all of this in a blog so that we can also make it easier to understand. Uh, you might be right, Peter, and I don't think you're the only one that is confused about all the list that we have so that we clearly say where uh, People need to find information. Um, unless any other has anything to say about the voting system uh, for prioritizing issues, I would maybe move on to the following point. Uh, okay, following point is decision-making mechanism. So um, there was a blog that was published and it was also published as a GitHub issue. I think the way that we were deciding about stuff within the working group, um, I have to say that at the time um, we didn't take into account the fact that people might express a neutral opinion. And so the mechanism that is currently in place doesn't really work if we have people saying, I don't have an opinion about this. So that's something that I wanted to discuss with you. Um, so what it the decision-making mechanism says at the moment is that basically the action proposed will be accepted if consensus with the working group is reached, meaning we have arrived at a decision or at least a compromise that everyone can live with, which in my opinion can mean that people can be neutral about it, but maybe they just need to have seen it. But then the most problematic bit comes after, which is as consensus is reached, and the issue is closed if at least two thirds of the working group members participate in the discussion and express their favorable opinion. Uh, and then there's, of course, a veto uh, for core library investors, uh, which at the moment are Open Knowledge Foundation, Imbo, and Utopian, uh, who may veto a proposed action. Um, 
So I'm just wondering if we need to delete the fact, express their favorable opinion, and we just take as good if everyone from the working group has looked at it and no one has vetoed it. Uh, but I was curious to know what you all think about that case. Um, I wonder if maybe we should have an option for triaging issues or kind of kicking it down the road formally and putting it like on the V3 list to reconsider if there's not, if there's only like a little bit of support, but not a lot of interest, because it would be, if we have limited resources to implement things, we probably want to focus on the ones that where we have the most support. And if there's just a small and mostly neutral kind of response, that could be, it could still be meaningful, but we should wait until we have a really kind of a stronger decision. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, is that something that you would see also in a scenario in which, because I can see that totally in a scenario in which maybe three or four people from the working group have had a look, but the others are not really interested. Would that apply also if people have a neutral opinion about it, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, uh, I would say, I guess we have to maybe define what the cutoff would be, either as a ratio of responses or total number of thumbs up or whatever. Um, but my sense is if we get one or two positive responses and eight, five or six or seven or eight neutral responses, maybe that's one that we could triage. And we could even come back to that list. Like if we get through everything else and have time and money to spare, we could go back to that list and start to reprioritize things. Yeah, again. Uh, you're muted again. Yeah, so in general, I think it's kind of like a good idea if we have kind of like uh, just uh, like this level that need to be, you know, uh, gotten to accept the change. So basically, for currently we have 10 members of the working group, so it's uh, 7 from 10. If 7 is not uh, reached, it's not accepted. It's, it can be like, it can wait till it's 7. Uh, maybe we can just, you know, ping people will ask, but um, then it's uh, kind of like making neutral uh, what, what voting option kind of like is not really useful because we still will be asking people to decide anyway. So um, I don't know, but in general, I think specs needs to be, need to be kind of like really, really static stable. It's okay if it's hard to make a change, but on the other hand, when, for example, this uh, kind of like iteration is finished, but we still, for example, want to uh, do some changes, for example, like in a year, adding like a few properties and working group is not like really active. It will be uh, hard uh, to reach this uh, consensus. So it's always, you know, it's always complicated when we talk about like committees and working groups. But currently uh, like seven from uh, 10 I think works fine if there we have two pull requests mostly neutral, neutral and we can ask people like in a month uh, maybe saying that it it won't be accepted if you don't change to yes and if if not okay it's okay it's not a problem at all it's minor things I think if someone has a strong opinion in favor and they're a minority, they could also maybe make an argument at one of the community meetings to try to kind of advocate for why they think it's more important than people appreciate. Yeah, I feel that could be a good solution, actually, because I feel that sometimes we could find ourselves in a situation in which maybe there's a feature that is not very interesting to a number of working group members, but it might still be something interesting to develop. Um, so maybe if these people need to make the case, that would make a lot of sense, I think. Um, so that would be a nice suggestion. Uh, Peter. Yeah, I, I mean, um, Evgeny, you did a lot of work, I think, this morning and yesterday and saying, yeah, this is approved, this is still in limbo, this is rejected. And then that's also, I think, for the people that are championing a certain certain change, it's also a very good indication, oh, wait, I need to do more uh, community building here to to have others agree. So I, I think I agree with Keith that if most of the support is neutral, 
a yeah we can keep it in limbo and if there's like one person there is like yeah but i really really want this then it's a like seeing that it's still in limbo and it's not yet approved is a very good feedback mechanism to then know, oh, I need to do more work here to actually convey why it is so important. So yeah, I don't think the wording needs to change and that the neutral ones are just considered, uh, yeah, neutral. It's like, I've looked at it, but I have no stake in this thing. Yeah. Okay, I think this makes sense. Um, so in terms of wording, I would just leave it as it is and that we need a favorable um, opinion by working group members. Has anyone anything to add to this point? Um, okay, so then let's move on to the next one, which is the process of cleaning specs navigation and other non-functional stuff. Um, so that's something that was brought up by Evgeny, and he was wondering if anyone was uh, interested here in reviewing those. I don't know if Evgeny, you want to say a few words more about this? Um, yeah, so... Yeah, I think it's like really vital to slightly improve uh, the navigation, the way headers work on the specs. Uh, so like uh, we have a clearer structure of uh, the metadata properties, like they're, they're like levels and all of them are uh, linkable. Uh, and the navigation like clearly shows that there is data package and there it like it's resources. But maybe it can be like, uh, there, there, there can be like different options how to st structure it, but it's I think needs to be improved from what we currently have. For example, for data resource, I think it doesn't even have like headers for properties because uh, I think it was like uh, wasn't focused previously. And uh, I'm just curious how we uh, promote changes like this, which is not like functional, not related to uh, the essence of the. Uh, Thanks. would it potentially work that for this uh how is it called non non-functional stuff uh the navigation when you guys work on this and if it's in a reviewable state, uh some of us look at this to see if it actually works rather than being very close to that development so yeah later down the road that we reviewed is rather than being part of the process and providing suggestions that you guys suggest something then we, re we review it um, yeah for, for, for this i think uh it's totally like it doesn't require like any work from outside it's uh inside of ours the main problem here is that uh, still uh, some can think that it's kind of like change so the the text of the like textual representation of for specification is a standard. So basically to change it, we need to uh, have some process. And for example, consider we currently have headers level like optional fields and non-optional fields. I would just remove it because it just, you know, it's um, just kind of like um, making the picture not clear. Uh, so what kind of approval I need to have to make this change? Maybe just, you know, proposing, saying that there is a pull request for it. If someone wants to, you know, to check, please check or say that it's like not appropriate or something like this. I, I think for my end, I link a lot to deep things in the spec from the frictionless R package. And the most annoying thing is I've just listed in the agenda. And I think my comments will come once the website is there and like certain things become annoying. I, I think I'll 
do that and and, and have suggestions rather than having the capacity to to review everything I don't know how it is for others yeah I, I'd say and Evgeny from my perspective being on the working group I'm interested in the specifications and not at all um, care about having an opinion on how we design the the page of the specifications and so it would be a mistake to consider a lack of uh, in commenting on a pull request as as not a positive vote or something if it's to do with just things like you know adding anchors to the specs page or something um yeah uh, so i don't know what the solution is but yeah i just i'm sure that there'll be other working group people similar who are who yeah like i i'm following your activity for the specs and and commenting but i don't care about the website <laughs> to put it straightforward, you know. So, but it doesn't mean anything about whether it's approved, you know, support or not support for a feature that you're adding. Uh, group also, uh, I think, what might make sense if uh, we just go forward with the uh, like this uh, non like essence changes and anyway, uh, before the publishing, like all the next version of the standard like in june or may uh it will be chance to you know to revert if something you know is or broken by mistake or whatever but they'll be anyway like sharing uh these updates just you know just for your information amazing thanks anything else on this Okay, um, so maybe let's move on to the next point, which is patterns. Uh, so there's this GitHub issue that I'm gonna put in the chat here. Um, basically our question is, how do we decide about the patterns? Is it okay to have a not fully refined pattern and are patterns kind of labs? I think it's very difficult to consider all patterns equal. I think there's patterns that have been there for a very long time that are also implemented. And there's patterns that have been suggested recently or are still being suggested. So to make them part of the specs, I think we have to go over them one by one to assess if they become part of the spec or not. I think that would be my take. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, only my friend. Uh, yeah, uh, I think Sarah mentioned most uh, more like uh, adding a pattern as a pattern. So currently, for example, we have this pull request, and to be honest, I don't I think I don't, don't just like uh, enough knowledge to decide either the like good pattern or it's it ready or not. So what can we do uh, regarding this? Because for example, previously we had a like really great. A pattern really actively commented and it was added a few months ago uh, regarding um enums uh so yeah so 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 what so i think patterns was a kind of like a, a important part of the standard structure if you say if you talk about standard that's kind of like a collection of uh specifications patterns guides like the whole project and uh, patterns was a kind of like a, um like first level, uh, like citizen here, uh, something that is a kind of like a spec like, but not in the main spec. So it should be kind of like a process of separating patterns. So I'm not sure what can we do. Uh, Keith, I think you had your hand raised or not? Maybe. Yeah, I was going to ask it. I wasn't exactly sure what the purpose of the patterns was. I remember coming across it in the past, but I've never really interacted with it. So I was going to ask someone to summarize it, but I think Evgani just pretty much did that. So, uh, 
Thank you. Oh, I'll try maybe maybe Paul <laughs> because I I wasn't there <laughs> when patterns you know arrived, but I can try just uh, quickly. So pattern the idea of a pattern that it's uh, some best practice that is used by some data publishers, but not yet popular enough to become uh, an official part of the spec. And for example, there is a pattern for uh, missing values per field, which is implemented the friction spy. And we might consider adding this pattern to the main spec, for example, for the version two, because it was, it was initially it was a pattern, then friction spy supported, supported uh, this pattern. And now uh, it might be uh, promoted to the main specification. Yeah, Paul, go ahead. I wonder if it's not a bit confusing the patterns thing, like, like as Evgeny said, that you know it was, it was added for a reason as kind of like a testing ground for some things before they can get added to a spec. But um, I'm wondering if it's not a bit disappointing for someone to do a contribution like that, and it's confu like I find it confusing. Evgeny said that contribution, like specifically that PR there, and then sort of, you know, potentially got told what well, it's not going to get added as a pattern because we don't have interest, or, you know, the working group or whoever doesn't have interest in it. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I guess there are different, like, like someone said before, there are different types of patterns and it's not clear to me, honestly, by this stage of the project, whether, why it wouldn't be better just to write an issue to make a suggestion or, the people who are implementing libraries around the specifications may in various cases be implementing functionality that goes beyond the specs and maybe feeding that back in as a as an example of an implementation uh, is is maybe a better way than um yeah than than the previous pattern approach uh, I, maybe evgeny you know how many over the years how many patterns have actually become part of the spec because I doubt it's I doubt it's a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah, I I honestly don't know. And to be like fully honest, initially kind of like I will, I thought that you know the pattern is really bad was a really bad idea because basically okay so there is a standard and there is a pattern. What what does it mean pattern? So if it's not fully supported at all, so but uh, then kind of. I thought about, okay, so here's in Brazil, people use translations. And in Brazil, they need, you know, some standardization of what they do. And uh, they created this translation pattern, for example. And looking at this pattern, we might uh, find it like useful later. So it's the way, so basically the, it's, it's the way people shared their approach. And now we can uh, consider it. Because if, if 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 there were no patterns, we wouldn't you know wouldn't know anything about uh, this way how people works. So in my opinion, kind of apps. So maybe it doesn't need to have you know kind of like high quality uh, requirements. And to your knowledge, I know that you have your hand raised, Keith. And I'll get to you in a second, but I think Peter asked a very compelling question in the chat, which is, was there a mechanism for patterns to become part of the specs? Or is there right now? Um, yeah, just I created like a few issues, like asking whether this pattern needs to be promoted to specs. So it's just through the, through the kind of like uh, individual contribution of any member promoting the uh, idea of uh, making pattern uh, part of the specs. Yeah, thanks again. Uh, Keith. So it seems like there's generally a lot of confusion, even just around the name of it. So that could be part of the problem. Um, it's not uncommon for libraries to have, have like a a section in their documentation on best practices or usage examples. And so maybe this could fit in there if we think there's some kind of cases that are useful to demonstrate. Um, but I think calling it patterns suggests something about the formality or like prioritization of it or importance. 
that we're not really clear on. So in these cases, I think if it's something that we're considering for the spec, then GitHub issues make sense. If it's a solution to a problem that people face, then put it in a cookbook or blog post or example or somewhere where people can maybe find it, but it's more obvious what it is. Yeah, thanks, Keith. Uh, Paul. Yeah, very strongly agree with what Keith said. And actually, I just read through the patterns. Um, it's a real walk down memory lane, some of it. And that's a problem because people things can be opened as issues and then closed out. But there's things here that probably could have been closed five years ago, but they're still like there's something like a pattern lives there now, whereas issues can get discussed and then said it's not relevant. But the patterns, there's things there that I, I guess just shouldn't be there anymore. Um, so yeah, I, I, I strongly support what Keith suggested now, some type of cookbook for things people are doing in the community, but I, I doubt that the pattern, um, that this implementation of it as patterns is, um, sort of fit for the current purposes now. Uh, Keith, you want to plug something? Yeah, just to quickly add to what you're saying, I think there is a huge benefit to simplicity. So wherever, like right now, there's a lot going on in the frictionless docs and it's sometimes hard to find things and confusing what's what. So the more we can decide what's really essential and simplify and focus on that and then cut out everything else and kind of put it somewhere more appropriate, I think everyone will benefit. And it might be worth explicitly thinking like each section of the documentation now, like, is it serving its purpose? Is it clear and what would it look like without it? That kind of thing. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, other comments on patterns? Peter. Yeah, as I wrote in the chat, yeah, I, I think the name patterns is is confusing and we should definitely change that and I agree with Paul that like if you want to suggest changes in the spec, that's a GitHub issue, but it's often also useful to um, reason why something is, or, or like you have a whole design process and you have a review of that, like how we did for the, um, for the enum labels, for example, to have that summarized in a blog post, I think was, is, is useful because it gives you a bit of a, a stable link that people can get a kind of an introduction. So it's like a best practices slash blog post and like linking to that or or having that, I think is, is still useful. Um, but yeah, we need to, I think the end result of a pattern is either it gets, it's an ID within a certain community and they implemented it there, or it's an ID and it got it abandoned, or it's an ID that has a lot of support and it becomes part of the spec. And that is a bit the life cycle of those things. And I think if you have like a, a date, something attached to it, like with a blog post or with a, a guide or a best practice that has like, yeah, that's how we do it, um, that that could, could work. But I think we move, we should move away from at least calling it patterns. Yeah, no, I agree. Maybe the name is a bit confusing and maybe having a kind of like as it, transition period could make a lot of sense. Um, and I like the idea of writing a blog, which could summarize and also would, that people can just have a look and know. Um, so yeah, that makes that makes sense. Okay. Um, next point, unless any last, Peter, something else you wanted to say. So if we take that decision, who's going to go over all the patterns and give them a certain place. There are, are they just going to remain on the old websites and not being ported to the new website? I mean, that's one option. And all incoming links will be preserved. And it's just like, yeah, we're not moving this to uh, the new website. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Keith and then again. Yeah, I think that's probably a good option. Another possibility would be to just copy the copy them into GitHub, and then we have a record there. Then we can make decisions in GitHub at that point on. 
Heb jij niet? Yeah, what if uh, patterns are just guides, just supported as guides or something like this? In the new website. Yeah, kind of like documentation as an option. Why don't we maybe vote on names and people can share what they think is the most intuitive. So guides, best practices, patterns, uses, just example, cookbook, all seem like they have some relevance maybe. But uh, yeah, regarding the like exact like technical work, we will do it uh, like, because we maintain uh, the website. Yeah, I like cookbook as well. I think it's a it's a fun name. Yeah, I'm not super familiar with patterns myself, but probably will need also to. notify the people that were behind those in the past about this happening. What do you think? Okay, that makes sense. I'll copy that to the notes. Yeah. Ah. Google. Just uh, unmute yourself. <laughs> my my raise hand. Um, no worries. Yeah. Um. It'll be hard to identify, but maybe it's possible through um the, doing a get blame on the on that file. Um, I can have a look a bit later. And I can see definitely a few that were just were either me or Rufus. But then there's some others that I don't remember. It is interesting. There's useful information in this file. You, we wouldn't want to get take it offline. Like just, you know, implementation details about integration with SPSS format, things like that. It's stuff that's, you know, if any poor soul is doing the uh, data interoperability between this and SPSS, then it will be great if they stumble across some little fact here. So it definitely is really crucial to keep it. And um, yeah, so I, I can have a look later um, and see if I can work out the um, where as many of these ideas originated from as possible and then updates um, somewhere, somehow. Yeah, great, thanks. So is the decision that we're renaming them cookbook and they will be part of the new documentation slash website, but not the specs and make it very clear that they're not part of the specs. Is that the final decision? I think seven seconds is the accepted uh, duration for, you know, taking it that no one is objecting. Exactly. I'll take it as a yes. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> um, okay. The last item that we wanted to discuss today is um, an intake integration with Anaconda. And Evgeny, maybe you can say a bit more about this. Yeah, probably, you think. We all kind of like got all tired, not answering you. So I just, uh, <laughs> just, just to say that, yeah, I had a meeting with uh, Martin Durant from Anaconda, and he's kind of like a maintainer of uh, high-profile high Python uh, 
packages like FSS pack, uh, etc. But I also uh, worked on the created uh, the intake project, and uh, it it was uh, the meeting was like basically okay. Here is my intake. There is our data package. Clearly, it's something uh, or entry question is clearly it's something like uh, alike, but. Uh, uh, how we think about some kind of integration. It wasn't clear, maybe he was also would like to maybe join forces for um, fundraising, et cetera. But it was like really first meeting. And um, I, I was uh, expecting maybe uh, David Gaskis is on the call today, so he can say something about it more because he proposed uh, in uh, this like discussion. So maybe next time we can uh you know discuss intake because honestly I, i'm not like fully aware of how it works and uh, if, if so, maybe someone on the call is aware but it's i think we're just running out of time so we can discuss it like next time but uh, please uh, if, yes. if something to say. we we can discuss it more next time but briefly tanda is like a dependency management for software um, it's used a lot in bioinformatics and other fields like scientific computing. Um, but it's nice because it allows you to basically execute a command to install some software and then it handles all the dependency management for you and you can easily kind of isolate or sandbox the software environment. So it's really a win for reproducibility. Um, I think there's also a tremendous need and space for a similar system, but for data, where one can basically execute a command on the command line, pull some process version of data and maybe dependencies of the data, like if it uses some metadata about states or countries or whatever that people use all the time, it would just grab it for you. Um, and this is something data package would be perfectly suited for, but that's a bigger effort and uh, maybe a discussion for another day. I'll just throw it out there now so people think about it. Yeah, thanks, Keith. That gave us a very good context. Uh, but yeah, we're running out of time, so I propose that maybe we discuss this more extensively next time. Um, so um, there's a couple of announcements that I wanted to make before um, before closing the call. Uh, first of all is that the next community call is going to be on the 29th of February. Um, I'm going to send out invites. Um, we are presenting the specs update at FOSDEM in Brussels on the 3rd of February. So if any one of you is going there, come by and say hi. Uh, we're going to be in the uh, open research dev room uh, that we're again co-hosting this year. And then also I wanted to say that CSV conference is going to Webla in Mexico uh, in May uh, from um, 29th and 30th of May. So if anyone is interested, the... Um, the application to give a talk is still open until the 31st of January. So you still have five, six days to do so. And yeah, I think that's it. Unless anyone else has anything that they would like to bring up. No? Okay, well, thanks everyone for this great discussion today. Uh, we'll see you again in a month. And meanwhile, we'll keep chatting uh, on the community chat and on GitHub. Thanks so much. Have a yeah, good day. Bye-bye.